Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for sticking through, um, you know, second day, end ish of the second day. So um, you are officially like the, the powerhouse of the conference. So thank you for being here. Um, we are going to be talking about um, registered reports and diving deep into what they are, how to think about them, how to integrate them into your research process, etc. One thing that I'll point out is that the uh, slides that we're using are um, available on OSF and there's a link to them on the bottom of every single slide so you don't have to like write it down really fast before I go. Um, Betsy, if you wouldn't mind putting it in like the chat or something, that could be really helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, first things first, we're gonna introduce ourselves and kind of our perspectives, where we're coming from, um, and then talk a little bit about the replication crisis and, and linking it to why registered reports are needed and useful. We'll talk about some of the basics of registered reports as well as the benefits and a little bit of meta research on registered reports. Um, we'll do a little compare and contrast between registered reports and pre-registration. Many of you were probably at the um, pre-registration session earlier today with um, uh, Karen and Scott. Um, and, and so hopefully you can see some kind of parallels. Um, and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about practical advice of just like what, um, how to think about registered reports for different kinds of research. And then we have a lot of resources. And of course, we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, Okay, so um, uh, my name is Amanda Montoya. Um, I'm an assistant professor of quantitative psychology at UCLA. Um, my background is mostly in psychology um, and actually probably the reason I'm here is that I do a lot of meta research about registered reports. So um, part of what I do is, is meta science. Um, and I actually have a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to study uh, early adoption of registered reports and, and kind of barriers and benefits, especially for early career researchers. Um, and I'll turn it over to Betsy. Hi, I'm Betsy McCoach. Uh, I'm at the University of Connecticut. I'm a professor of research methods measurement and evaluation in the Department of Educational Psychology, which is in the NEAG School of Education there. Um, and I am, uh, I am an official registered report uh, user. I have had my first phase one acceptance um, by, from exceptional children relatively recently, and we're working on actually the, the submission, the final submission. Um, so I think I'm, you know, newer to open science. I was thinking back on this and thinking, I remember six years ago when uh, Matt Makel and Matt McBee said to me um, that they thought that I was a journal editor at the time and they thought that we should do what I now know are registered reports, but I had no idea what they were. And they, they explained the concept to me and I was like, what? Nobody, no journal is ever going to do that, right? And so now, um, you know, I think back on prior me and, and think, wow, I was I was all wet on that, and I'm so glad that we are where we are now. So, but but Amanda brings the seasoned perspective, and I bring the you know newly converted in the last let's say three four years perspective. Awesome. Great. So uh, we're going to start out just by talking a little bit about the replication crisis and kind of how it started. And, and a lot of this is really motivating like why we think um, registered reports are really important. Um, one of the things that I noticed as we were like preparing this presentation is a lot of the, the kind of context we're talking about the replication crisis comes from psychology. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about uh, education specifically, but I do think a lot of this kind of happened in psychology and then like boiled over into education. Um, so there were a lot of things that happened kind of around 2011, 2012. So uh, Daryl Bem published a paper in, in uh, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, uh, which is a, a really highly regarded journal in that area. And that paper, um, 
essentially published a bunch of studies that all had very small sample sizes that supported the claim of extrasensory perception. And, um, you know, in, instead of convincing, um, you know, all of social psychology that extrasensory perception was real, um, the impact that this paper had was actually to, to cause people to kind of reflect on whether um, their own research practices that were common in the field were really the right things to be doing. Um, so seeing these different studies um, called to question issues about were there studies that weren't reported um, that, that he ran but maybe didn't report in the paper. So this is sometimes called the file drawer problem. Um, some of the analyses between the different studies are slightly different, which might suggest that people are kind of adjusting the analysis procedure um, as they go, um, which could be called p-hacking. Um, and then some of the sample sizes were very like even, like 100, and some of them were kind of not very even, like 92, um, which also called to question maybe they were analyzing the data and then stopping right when they found statistical significance. So um, there have been a lot of attempts to replicate these studies that have failed. I, I will note that there is one uh, uh, successful replication, but it includes the original author. Um, so no kind of independent research uh, team has been able to replicate this uh, study. Around the same time, there was a paper that came out in Psych Science um, that talked about this idea. Um, it's often called the false positive psychology paper. And it talked about specific research practices um, that are often used in psychology and education um, that can increase your likelihood of making type one errors. And um, this paper was actually like my introduction to open science or meta science or the replication crisis or whatever. I read it like right when it came out, I had a great methods instructor. Um, this is like when I was an undergrad. Um, and so they actually demonstrated this by running a study where they asked people to listen to the song when I'm 64 and, um, and then essentially used what they called researcher degrees of freedom to find evidence that listening to the song makes you older. So they tried a bunch of different DVs, they tried optional stopping, so collecting data, analyzing, deciding to collect more data or not, um, adding and excluding covariates, excluding cases, um, selecting conditions to report. Um, so they actually ran more than just two conditions, but then ultimately they only kind of reported two conditions. And this paper really had an impact on me because I saw a lot of these practices being used in the lab that I was working in at the time. I worked in a social psychology lab. I was doing my undergraduate honors thesis. And I was like, wow, this is just like par for the course for what I do. And I thought it was normal, but I wasn't thinking about the implications that it could have on finding effects that maybe aren't real. So this paper really, I think, kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to some potential issues in the research practices that are used, especially for data analysis. Um, in 2015, so, you know, this study actually like started around the time that um, that that around 2011, um, but ultimately takes a long time to do a, a bunch of large scale replications. But so this paper that came out in 2015 that was published in Science was a large scale replication attempt that involved 36 research labs. They selected 100 studies from cognitive and social psychology. Um, the evaluation of like, what does it mean to replicate a study that's kind of still up for debate. So I'm reporting a lot of different um, metrics here, but one of the things that really surprised me was that the average effect size was about half of the original effect size. So just looking at what they found versus the original papers, the effect sizes essentially get cut in half. 36% um, of the replications found statistical significance in the direction that was originally um, found. 47% of the, the uh, effect sizes are contained in the confidence intervals. There was a subjective rating of replication. Um, and also uh, they meta-analyzed the estimates. And in general, the major finding is like these replication rates are so much lower than we would hope for our field. Um, most of these are less than 50%. But this is psychology. So also around the same time, there were a couple really high profile fraud cases. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about like P hack is P hacking fraud or like what counts as fraud, because all of these things kind of boiled up in the in the field of psychology all at the same time. 
Um, so, so there were a number of high profile fraud cases where they found people who just like legitimately faked their data. Um, and all of this was kind of happening around the same time. One thing that I'll point out is that there were a lot of really strong proponents of a, a lot of these messages before 2011. This wasn't just like some magical time where, I mean, in some senses it was magical and everything came together. But there were a lot of people who laid the groundwork for this. So uh, Tony Greenwald has been writing about some of these issues since like the 70s. Jeff Loftus has, has been doing a lot of work in this area, especially um, uh, emphasis on confidence intervals and data visualization. Um, and then obviously, um, Ian Edes in the medical field has been talking about this and, and Rosenthal as well. So um, I'm not to say that this like all started in 2011. There are a lot of people laying the groundwork before that. So one of the things that I was thinking about as we were preparing this is, is whether or not there's evidence that there is a replication crisis in education, because there's not really the, the big OSF study that has um, you know, replicated a bunch of, of um, studies in education yet. They're working on it, actually. Um, but I think one of the pieces of information that we do have comes from actually a very recent paper by Matt Makel um, asking education researchers about their different research practices. And so um, what they found in general is that um, uh, researchers in education are using both questionable research practices and open research practices. So um, in general, what they're, they're finding is that, that even if we haven't done a lot of large scale replications of education research, we have um, we are seeing that people in education are using the same practices that people in psychology were using that we think are kind of causing some of these issues. But we're also seeing people adopting open research practices, which is um, really promising for, for progress towards the future. So thinking about kind of being in the replication crisis, we want to think about like, how do we come out of the replication crisis or how do we come out into the, the replication revolution um, or the credibility revolution? I think I think that's um, Samin Bazir's term. And um, so the open science framework started, which is just huge and, and really, really important. There's kind of an increased focus on this issue of publication bias and the file drawer problem. Um, and then a lot of these open science practices emerged. So we got the, um, the badges where we get a badge if you pre-register or use open data or open materials, a lot more um, uh, encouragement of replication research. Um, and actually specifically in education, IES implemented these um, SEER standards. Um, I guess that's redundant, SEER somethings, um, where, uh, in these standards, a lot of these open practices are um, are recommended, which is is super great. So I want to talk a little bit about what we think of as kind of the symptoms of the the replication crisis. So questionable research practices. So thinking about p hacking, um, where you know you do your analysis and it doesn't come out quite the way you expect, and so you're like, well. You know, this variable is a little skewed. Maybe I should try a transformation or, oh, there's a couple cases that seem kind of funny. Maybe I should drop them. And a lot of this is stuff that we kind of do automatically that we're not really thinking about as like, like purposeful cheating, right? But it's kind of like you're doing your analysis and you didn't really have a concrete plan. And so you kind of wander around in your data for a while until you find something that looks good. And then you're like, oh, that must be the right way to do it. Um, Another thing that is pretty common is uh, called harking, which is hypothesizing after results are known. And this is, uh, I love this figure of this guy kind of drawing the targets around the bullet holes, because I think that that is just like so common, um, is when you find results that don't align with your hypotheses, our kind of automatic reaction is to think about like, okay, what would explain what I found? You know, so if you find results in the opposite direction of what you, you thought, you would start thinking about like, well, what's the theory behind that? What would support that? And um, the issue is that when that goes into the introduction and makes it seem like that was your plan all along, that's not really reflecting your scientific process. Um, another big issue is publication bias, which is this issue that, that um, researchers as well as journals and editors often uh, prefer statistically significant results in uh, publications. And so researchers won't submit publications 
publications, if they um, don't necessarily have p-values that are less than 0.05 or don't support their original hypotheses. But then also, even if you do submit that, it might not make it through the peer review process. Um, and then this is also related to the file drawer problem where we're just kind of keeping our research to ourselves sometimes if we think, um, you know, especially when we uh, have non-significant results, we will potentially just say, well, I don't think that I can publish this, so I'm, I'm just going to um, put it in my file drawer. Um, we should rename this to be like the Google Drive problem. <laughs> um, nobody has file drawers anymore. So one of the things that I think is a really kind of driving factor behind all of this is the, the culture of publication and the culture of academic research, which is this publisher parish idea that you have to publish to get a job, to keep your job, and to continue progressing in your job. And the issue with this is that when publication bias is also a problem, that means you essentially have to find significant results to keep your job or to fund your students or to, you know, to do any of these things. Um, and so early career researchers, so people who don't have as much job security, um, seem to be at kind of higher risk of using these questionable research practices because they need to publish. I need to publish, um, you know, to keep my job. And um, a lot of research has, has shown that trainees and early career researchers um, can report this issue of feeling like they have to manipulate their results in order to publish um, so that they can move on, get a tenure track job, or even just keep their current job. So in general, what this means is that the incentives don't really align with um, adopting ethical research practices because um, we have to publish, which means we have to find significant results, which means sometimes we have to p-hack, which is kind of the the issue that, that we're struggling with. So in comes registered reports, and this is what we're really here to talk about. So the idea behind a registered report is that um, instead of doing all of your work and then sending it to a journal, what you're going to do is after you've designed your study and after you're kind of ready to rumble, um, you actually submit a report to a journal and that's the journal that you intend to publish in like the final report. So typically what that means is submitting an intro methods and analysis plan or some journals ask for results section with like blanks um, where all the numbers would go and you just have to kind of look at what the journal requires. But you're submitting that prior to conducting your research. Um, and this is a stage one peer review. So the idea here is that actually the, these three sections are going to go out for peer review and the decision about whether or not your paper in full will be published is made before you have collected or analyzed your data. And one thing that I'll mention, we'll talk about secondary data analysis um, in particular, uh, but it is possible to do this with secondary data analysis, which means maybe the data is collected, but you haven't analyzed it yet. So um, the stage one submission goes out for peer review. There's often just like a normal kind of publication process. There's a lot of iterative, um, you know, uh, uh, revisions with the reviewers. And then ultimately the goal is to get what's called an in principle acceptance, which means that the journal is making a commitment to publish the paper um, so long as you kind of stick to uh, what it is that you planned on doing. And we'll talk about, you know, deviations away from your plan and what that means and what, you know, are those acceptable. So once you have an in principle acceptance, you will conduct your research as planned and then prepare your final manuscript. You'll submit that to um, your stage two peer review, which is typically um, there to just kind of check that you did what you said that you were gonna do. Um, the reviewers can't at that point ask you to do anything other than what you said that you were gonna do. Um, and they're really just there to kind of check that you were doing um, at, as you said, and that your claims like in the discussion section are aligned with the findings that you um, found. So uh, there's two peer review stages in a registered report, which is a little different than the traditional mechanism, um, but still, still kind of in line with, with um, it's still attached to a journal. So one of the things that we have to think about when we're doing a registered report is who needs to be involved. And this is a little bit different from pre-registration, if you're familiar with that, which is that you are attached to a specific journal. When you're doing the stage one process, um, you're submitting to a specific journal. The editor and reviewers for that journal are involved in this process, whereas with pre-registration, it's kind of something you do internally with your lab. 
And one of the things that I think is super important is to get the right people involved up front. Um, so if you typically involve statistical consultants or librarians, other kind of external people in your research, it's really worthwhile to get those people involved as you're preparing the stage one submission. Um, so for example, actually last week, I had a consulting meeting where somebody said, hey, you know, we're working on a stage one registered report and um, we have this really complex data analysis. Can you help us write the analysis plan? Um, so that's somebody who is like getting their team together very early, which is ideal. Um, planning and timing for registered reports can be kind of complicated because of that issue of the multiple stages of the of the um, review process. And it, it's quite a deviation from, I think, what is for me and, and many others, kind of the norm, which is that like you do all this planning and then you go straight into data collection. Um, personally, I've actually found that having that kind of break in between the planning and the data collection actually is really helpful for me, um, but I can understand this being a deviation away from whatever the norm is. So one thing um, that you wanna be thinking about is that the stage one should be timed like a pre-registration. It has to come before there is data collection. And one of the difficulties is, is that you then have to account for the review period before collecting the data. And so if you're planning on collecting data, um, you know, maybe you're going into schools in the fall, you'll really have to be planning for that review period um, before going into the schools. Um, so for example, actually that team that approached me, they said, we wanna do this data collection in spring 2023. And I said, plan for about eight months in the review period. I think that's like a sufficiently long, you know, um, window so that you're not going to like miss your time. Stage two peer review tends to be much shorter. So oftentimes uh, the stage one review process is a similar length to kind of the traditional process, except oftentimes you have to shop around at fewer journals. Um, and so, and then the stage two peer review process tends to be quite short. Um, and there's this nice paper by Hardwick and Ian Edes um, that actually looked at kind of timing for publication. So they looked at how long from in principle acceptance to publication, um, and then how long from stage two to submission to publication. Um, and so one thing to notice is that this um, in principle acceptance to publication includes the time to do the research, right? And so depending on how long it takes to do research in the field that you're in, that time is going to be quite different. One of the benefits though, like as an early career researcher, I love putting that in principle acceptance on my CV very early. You know, it's like, this is a guaranteed publication, um, which is really, really nice. So in education, there are actually a lot of different journals that you can submit to um, that, that now accept registered reports. And so currently more than 250 journals kind of field across many fields um, have adopted registered reports. Um, those who are kind of keeping track of the published registered reports, there's about 450, maybe about 500 now. And I wanted to give some examples of some journals within education that, that publish registered reports, because this is often the thing that is um, such a barrier to folks is that if you don't know where to publish a registered report, you just don't even know where to start. Um, so all of these journals that are listed here are education focused journals that publish registered reports. Um, there's also a number of different um, lists of journals if you're especially if you're kind of on the edge of education or you're looking for something that's like domain specific. Um, so the open science framework has a list of registered reports and then or journals that publish registered reports and then my lab also has a database that's kind of. Um, searchable and filterable, and I'll show you an example of it um, later. Um, and I think that it, it's very useful for like finding the journal for you. Um, so I just wanted to point to a few examples of registered reports in education. I think it's really helpful to kind of imagine, you know, so to understand what do these ultimately look like. Um, so AERA Open actually did a special collection of registered reports. So these are seven registered reports in education. And actually something that I really love that they did is that all of the authors wrote short reflections about the process. And I think reading these can give you a really good sense of how people feel after doing a registered report, which is like overwhelmingly positive. Um, it's, it's, 
such a better process than, than the traditional process. Um, I also pulled a couple other examples, one from developmental science and one from learning and instruction. And these are just if you're kind of going back and trying to look for examples in education. I've actually found it to be kind of hard to like search for examples in a specific field. So I wanted to give you a few um, that you can start with. Um, in, just in terms of a little bit of history of registered reports, so um, so registered reports started at um, two different journals in 2013. Um, so Cortex, which is a, a kind of cognitive and neuroscience journal in psychology, was one of the first to, to adopt this. And then we've seen it adopted kind of more broadly within um, psychology, as well as other STEM journals. The Royal Society for Open Science started, which was really great. And then it's expanded into um, political science, clinical trials, um, and just like kind of built out over and over and over. Um, and indeed, what one thing that we're seeing is that there are a lot of registered reports now being published about um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and thinking about um, how to include uh, registered reports in clinical research as well. Okay, this is um, just a little example of the database that our team has created. So you can actually search based on a uh, research area. Um, so all of the journals are classified based on their area. So for example, um, I work in research methods and statistics. So I might wanna look at journals that do, um, do that. Um, and so this is a really nice way to just kind of filter out the journals that do things that are not related to what you do. Um, you can also search by, um, uh, impact factor, whether or not they accept replications, whether or not they accept secondary data, um, whether or not they're doing a special issue. Um, and we're still building out this tool a lot. So if there are certain fields that you would want a filter by, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to, to like expand out this tool because I, I love it. Um, so yeah, so a couple of the benefits of registered reports, um, many of you are probably at the uh, pre-registration section. Um, so pre-registration has a lot of benefits uh, such as like reducing peer hacking and harking because you have kind of a record for yourself of um, what exactly you did. It can help open the file drawer where you could see pre-registrations of studies. And then um, maybe even if they don't get published, you could actually see that, you know, oh, lots of people have pre-registered studies looking at this effect and then never gotten them published. Those are probably no results. Um, and it's also really helpful for distinguishing between informing theories and testing theories. In addition to pre-registration, though, there's a lot of benefits of registered reports. So one thing that is really clear is it reduces publication bias in the file drawer problem. Because the decision to publish is made before your data is collected and before you have any p-values. So we can't select on p-values that we don't have, which is great. I've also found that, that doing registered reports has improved my research design because the reviewers are giving feedback on your design before you've collected the data. So there's actually a lot more things that you can change about the research that you're doing um, before you actually collect the data. And so you have the ability to like adjust your design if it wasn't kind of ideal. A lot of journals also have power requirements, so they're, they're asking you to do some kind of power analysis to justify your sample size, um, and that can also kind of improve the, the quality of your, your data. Um, this can also be useful if you end up in a stage one um, submission and somebody says, somebody already did that. Um, it's way better to learn that before you've collected the data than after. Um, and so you can cut ties with ideas if they're not working out for some reason, but before you've invested a lot of resources in them. And um, in general, registered reports have been used to incentivize other open science practices. So a lot of um, journals that publish registered reports will require or ask you to post your materials and data. And a lot of these journals are encouraging replication research, which is great. Um, so just in general, I think registered reports have a lot of benefits. There's this streamlined review process. You are reducing wasted resources of studies that never make it out into the world. Um, and you're guaranteed a publication even if you get a null result, which I think is just fab. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the 
the review process, because I think a lot of people are feel anxious about the idea of, oh, I have to do two peer reviews instead of just one. Um, but I wanted to kind of demonstrate, at least in my experience, what kinds of comments I've gotten um, on research using these two different kinds of mechanisms. So when I'm doing a non-registered report, I can often get feedback um, that is pretty, I would say, demoralizing. Um, so you do all this work and you get peer review and then you get comments like you need to run more analyses, you know, this is not sufficient, you need to do this crazy SEM or this other thing. I did a paper recently where um, it wasn't a registered report and the reviewer was like, you have to take this and look at moderation by all of these other variables and I was like, why? Um, uh, you can get feedback like your study is not adequately powered. You need to run it again, but with more people. And so you're just like throwing away the data from the original people, which sucks. Um, there's a confound in your original design, so you have to run another study. Um, or this question is uninteresting and not worth exploring. Don't we already know this, right? So this is all pretty uh, difficult feedback to get at this point when you've already collected data, you've already like invested a lot of resources. My experience with registered reports has been quite different, where you can get the same feedback, but at a different point in time, and the impact of it is so different. So when you're getting that kind of feedback at the stage one peer review, um, the reviewers can suggest that you change your analysis plan, and especially if they know something about um, you know, doing a more effective test of your hypothesis, then you're changing your analysis plan instead of like tacking on a bunch of additional analyses. Um, you can also just plan to collect more people the first time, right? Instead of having to throw away all the, all the initial people, you can just um, collect more people the first time around. If there's a confound in your design, you can fix it before you've collected any data, which is awesome. Um, and also, if your question is uninteresting, at least you haven't, um, you know, collected all this data and, and used all these resources. So the idea here is that after you've addressed all these things, you can get an in-principle acceptance. And then at the stage two peer review, the comments that you can get from reviewers are very different. So they're not focused on whether or not you did the study or proposed the study the right way, but instead they'll ask uh, questions like, did you explore these questions? And you could, they can suggest that you add them as exploratory analyses, but they would be labeled as such. Um, and you can also just say no to them at that point too, um, if you're feeling bold. And um, sometimes, you know, if your results don't align with your uh, discussion section, reviewers can also kind of correct you in that connection there to say like, oh, I think you're overclaiming the results or, you know, especially like if you accept the null hypothesis, right? These are things that reviewers can catch at stage two. But again, they're not criticizing the design of the study or any of the things that they've already approved. So there's um, a growing literature of uh, meta science on registered reports. So I wanted to kind of highlight these in terms of talking about the benefits. Um, so uh, there's a study that looked at the computational reproducibility of uh, registered reports and found that registered reports are more computationally reproducible than traditional publications. So these are papers that had open data and open code. Can we replicate the results? And registered reports are more replicable or reproducible. Um, and uh, there's quite a bit of research that suggests that there's uh, less publication bias and less harking in uh, registered reports. Uh, registered reports are more likely to include replication research, um, and they're particularly popular among grad students and postdocs. The numbers drop off around assistant professors, and that's like where I'm very focused on in my own research is like why, why is there that difference? Um, but I, I think it, it's actually kind of interesting because a lot of people I've talked to are like, oh, but the students, the students won't want to do this. And in my experience, the grad students and postdocs love doing this. Um, it's really, really nice to just like have a guaranteed publication. Um, and in general, authors and reviewers overall report a really positive experience with registered reports. 
Um, there's this other really great paper, and I wanted to give it a whole slide. Um, uh, so this is a, a paper led by uh, uh, Courtney Soderberg, uh, who was was or is at OSF. Um, and they actually did this really neat study where they um, had researchers peer reviewing pairs of papers, and they compared registered reports to kind of really, really nicely matched traditional papers. And registered reports outperformed traditional papers on um, uh, 19 criteria, so outperformed or matched. Um, so sometimes people are concerned with registered reports that they won't be as creative or novel, um, and that that was not supported in this um, finding. And then actually a lot of things like quality of results, overall quality of the paper, um, how important is the paper, those are actually higher in registered reports than traditional papers, which is very encouraging. Um, okay. Betsy, is this where we switch or or is the next slide where we switch? <laughs> I think it's the next slide, but okay. Okay. So just to briefly kind of compare and contrast pre-registrations, we haven't talked a lot about pre-registration, but for those of you who were in the session earlier today, um, I thought it would be useful to kind of give a compare and contrast. So um, the, the pre-registration is often a little bit shorter than a stage one registered report because you don't have to include like all the intro elements. Um, but one thing that I find really cool is that for most journals, um, if you're doing a stage one registered report, you can then just take that stage one and stick it in a pre-registration file. And then that's your pre-registration, which kind of doubly um, seals you in, which is nice. Um, Pre-registrations are not attached to a journal. So registered reports are attached to a journal where you're submitting to a specific journal where you want to publish. Um, the timeline for pre-registrations is also a little bit more um, flexible where you can pre-register and then immediately do your research. So if you're in a situation where you need to do that, pre-registration is a great, um, great alternative to registered reports. So it doesn't have kind of all of the benefits, but definitely many benefits, which is always ideal. Um, we talked about doing 20% uh, uh, 20, 20 of the effort can do 80% of the work, right? Definitely, like, if you're in a situation where you're like, I can't do a registered report for this, you might as well just pre-register. And then um, peer review occurs twice for registered reports. And then um, for pre-registration, because it's not attached to a journal, um, that will actually, the peer review occurs after the full manuscript is written and submitted to the journal. Okay. So I've talked a lot, so I'm going to uh, hand it over to Betsy, who is going to talk to us about uh, specific considerations. Great. So um, which one is right for your study, pre-registration or registered reports? And Amanda's already alluded to a couple of these points, but I want to elaborate a little bit more. Um, so pre-registrations are obviously can really have an advantage when you're under time constraints. So you really don't have the time to send something out for review and you know, get those reviews back. Um, if you're just about to start data collection and you can't delay it or you don't wanna delay it, then you don't wanna be sending out a registered report, right? You really need to have the time to let it go out for peer review. Uh, obviously a pre-registration is also a better option if you have a specific journal in mind and it's your dream journal and they don't accept registered reports because then you can't do a registered report. Having said that, um, I wouldn't be shy about asking a journal that doesn't actually already have a registered report policy about whether they might consider a registered report. I know that, um, so I was the journal editor of Gifted Child Quarterly right before Jill Adelson, and it was under Jill Adelson that they started to accept registered reports. But I know for a fact that the very first registered report that was done for Gifted Child Quarterly, what was actually basically a pilot. It was a, it was, um, a researcher who came to Jill and asked if she would be willing to consider a registered report and uh, Jill was already on the bandwagon for open science, by the way, but, but so she, so they were kind of already maybe headed in that direction, but um, they did that and it went well and everybody liked it. And so then they developed a, a full policy about allowing registered reports to, you know, be one of the ways that, um, you know, one of the ways that you can submit to the journal. I would say you're probably more likely to have, um, success with the strategy I just described, if you're talking about maybe a more, a smaller niche journal. I mean, if it's the 
absolute biggest journal in the field and they've got like a 5% acceptance rate already for all their, you know, right. Then, then maybe that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the journal to try with, but if there's a smaller journal in your field and, you know, you're, you know, sort of on friendly terms with the editors, I don't see why you couldn't, you couldn't try it. And I do feel like Amanda said this from the perspective of the authors, but uh, when I've talked to editors who are using registered reports or who are accepting registered reports as part of their journal, editors love it too, actually. Um, again, when I, I mentioned that, you know, six years ago, when I heard about this idea, I said, oh my gosh, that sounds crazy. Two sets of reviews? Oh, no. But, but the reality is that it, it, is, it, ha it is actually good. It's good for the journal too. It's good for the journal and editors tend to really, when they try it, they tend to like it. So, okay. Um, and then, you know, you can't change your design and if you can't change your design and methods at all in response to the stage one review, so you are already locked in with what you're going to do, then, then you should consider pre-register, well, you should pre-register, you should not submit for a registered report. So what might be an example of that? Well, let's say this is your dissertation and it's already gone through your dissertation committee and you know, they, you don't have the flexibility to actually change your design and methods because this is the thing that was agreed upon by your dissertation committee. So that, you know, that might be an example of a time when you might not want to submit for a registered report. Um, having said that, well, I mean, I think that's true, but I'll just say um, that I think that one of the reasons that I really like this idea of a registered report is that I think it is actually very analogous to the exact process that we use with doctoral students when we have them go through the dissertation process. So the phase one or the stage one um, is very much like a dissertation proposal. And the big difference though, is instead of having your committee review and you know, give you feedback and it's instead you have these you know, three or four anonymous reviewers who are actually giving you feedback at that stage. But I've always felt like um, and I've been a major advisor on lots of different dissertation committees. And, you know, I think I like to think of myself as a pretty good researcher, pretty smart person, but I can honestly say that 99 plus percent of the time, um, when you get three really smart people in a room together, you know, when you get your committee or five, however many there are, when you get your committee in the room together, usually the study actually gets better, right? As a result of, lots of people being able to give some feedback about the study. And obviously this, this process is a little bit different. You're not actually getting in a room with your reviewers, but I think it, it, it actually functions in very much the same way. So it's, it's, you know, getting more feedback and having external eyes be able to say at the design phase, hey, did you think about this? Hey, you might not want to do it that way. I think it's so helpful. And so many times that I've been a reviewer, you read a paper after it's already been done and you think, oh gosh, this would have been so much better, except there's, you know, there's this one little fatal flaw that they wouldn't have had to do, but they did it. Now they have the data and now it's sunk, right? And, and here you really have the opportunity to make that design better. So, okay. So I was supposed to be talking about when pre-registrations are better, and I just went off and said all these great things about registered reports. But um, so, so those are some times when you're more likely to want to use pre-registrations. Registered reports are a better option, obviously, if you still have time to make changes to the study. So how do you think about the timing of that a little bit? Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we had a, a we have a phase one acceptance at exceptional children, and or stage one, sorry, I keep saying phase. We have, a, we have a stage one acceptance at exceptional children and it's actually for a secondary data analysis. And we were getting uh, data from multiple, um, multiple large school districts uh, as, part of, as part of the study. And so what we did, and it's actually a grant funded project. So once we had the grant funding, the first thing that we did is we sat down and we worked on the registered report at the same time that we were working on recruiting the districts, because it can take a really long time to recruit districts. And so when we wrote the registered report, we actually created a table that said, 
you know, we are reaching out to like these 10 districts, here's what they look like, you know, here's what, you know, we gave um, information about the, de the demographics of those districts and then said, we will start, a, you know, obviously after the registered report is accepted, but we will start data analysis and start the study once we have secured permission from and data from at least five of those districts, right? So, so we didn't know exactly which districts were going to be in the study, but we said, you know, we'll have at least five of them. This is what the 10 look like, at, you know, sort of you, you judge if you're comfortable with that. And the, the reviewers, the reviewers were, and that was really nice because we were able to actually be, you know, sort of circulating back and forth with the registered report. And we actually had a revise and resubmit um, to the registered report. And so at that point, we had actually really gotten much more clarity about which of the districts weren't going to be participating. And so in our revise and resubmit for the, for the stage one, we revised that table and said, you know, which wasn't something they asked for necessarily, but said, okay, you know, when we first submitted this, we thought it would be five of these 10. Now we actually know it's going to be these five. This is what we've got. This is how we're going to move forward. So that, you know, worked out really well for us. And the timing was really good because we, we kind of had dead time anyway, because we were trying to get the data from the districts. And as, you know, one or two districts came in, we just put the data to the side and said, we're not going to look at any of these data, right, until we've, until we've got our acceptance. So that, that worked out really well. So sometimes you can be I think a little bit maybe more clever about thinking about how you set the timing of your study so that it isn't such a long lag time that that becomes problematic. Um, obviously, there are advantages to both in the sense that we're making our hypotheses transparent. People often think that you know once you do a pre-registration or a registered report that your hands are completely tied and you can't make any changes, which obviously isn't isn't necessarily true. I mean, sometimes you do have to make changes uh, for one reason or another. For example, you know, let's just say we hadn't gotten the five, you know, what if we had only gotten four districts, right? Instead of five, you know, that would have been something we would have had to change. But um, so you might have to, you know, you might have to make changes. You don't, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because we've got something about deviations, but um, you can you can also add exploratory analyses in if you want to explore interesting findings. If you have to make deviations, then obviously you're going to make that transparent. So I think the big thing here is whatever you're doing, you're specifying up front, you're being really transparent about your plans. And if your plans change, either because you want to dig deeper in some aspect or because something's happened that you didn't anticipate, which by the way, anybody who does research in schools knows that unanticipated things can happen, then you just make all of that really transparent and you explain the logic of it. All right, so next. Um, yeah, so we talked about time management. The time really does operate a little bit differently with registered reports. So, you know, the sooner you can start writing things up for your registered report, the better. And if you think about even when you're writing grant proposals, the grant proposal itself is in some sense the start of a registered report. There are lots of pieces of a registered report that are very similar to the pieces from a grant proposal. So again, when we were doing our registered report, we went, we didn't do it at the same time as our grant proposal. We actually did it right after, but uh, we went back to our grant proposal and the verbiage from our grant proposal became the starting point for the registered report. But what I really appreciated about the registered report process was that even though I felt like we had a lot of detail in our grant proposal, and we did, um, it really forced us to think through a few things that maybe hadn't made it into the original grant proposal. So we got even more specific. And, and sitting down as a team and really working on that registered report together was so helpful. It, I mean, we had this recipe, we knew it, we, we had these hard conversations before we ever had data. And then we sort of, we all got on the same page and we knew exactly what we wanted to do. So I can't really say enough about the process. It was so, so helpful. Um, and I will also say this, we found, we said that we would pre-register, you know, we, we specified in our grant 
these are the studies that we're going to pre-register. And then these are the studies that where we're going to do registered reports. And a lot of that had to do with the timing of it. Like we're, we also have an experimental study going on as part of this large grant. Um, and they're just, they're just too many moving pieces. And by the time we get everything figured out, there isn't enough time to go back and forth with the peer review. So we're going to pre-register that study instead of doing a registered report. Um, but the IES, which is our, was our grant is with IES, they really, really liked the fact that we were promising to do registered reports or, and or pre-registrations for our large studies. So um, I think, you know, having these, having initial phase, and when we told them we had the initial phase one acceptance, um, they were super, super excited. So it really looked good on our grant progress report. Um, so, you know, there are some things you can think about in terms of creative solutions for, you know, timing in terms of registered report. Um, you know, you might be, for example, maybe you're doing a study where you're, you know, collecting pilot data before you actually launch the larger study. And so maybe you're writing a register, you know, maybe you're writing registered report for the larger study while you're in the process of sort of developing the intervention or writing the pilot data. Um, and, you know, you do need to think about, you do need to think about the timeline for review, obviously. I think that's important. Um, I was in a session yesterday, actually, where the editors from Exceptional Children were talking about the fact that they're very sensitive to the fact that, you know, when you've put something in for this, for stage one, that you are basically, you know, not going to do any any research until you've gotten that acceptance. And so they said they, A, try really hard to kind of accelerate the time frame as much as they can. So they kind of push the reviewers to get those review, reviews back in a really timely manner. And B, um, the idea came up yesterday sort of in that session that maybe it's a good idea for the journal editors to actually be asking about the timeline that people have so that they can, you know, when those registered reports come in so that they can make sure that the timelines are being met. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is kind of just another whole issue in terms of timing, which is the IRB and the registered report. Now, every place has a different kind of research compliance office. I don't know what yours is like where you are, but ours is mighty tough. And they really want every single detail specified. And if one little teeny tiny thing changes, it means that you need to go back and submit an amendment to the IRB. Obviously, you know, this is somewhat dependent on A, the kind of research you're doing. Is it, you know, is it, does it require full review or expedited review or is it exempt, right? So obviously there's a little bit maybe more leeway with some of the exempt studies than there are with other types of studies. And it also depends on your research compliance office. But if you're in a place where once you have a, an IRB in place that any tiny deviation is going to cause you to have to go back and make major amendments, which is then going to add more time to the whole process, then you might want to think about doing the registered report prior to submitting the IRB, right? And that might sound like, oh my gosh, now you're telling me that I've got to do this registered report and then the IRB and then the study. And again, it depends, I guess, on how long your IRB office takes to get results, I mean, to get uh, feedback to you because you know, that could be your major sticking point. But I think the good news is that what your registered report looks like is probably going to be very similar to what your IRB protocol looks like. And again, our IRB, our IRB office always appreciates extensive detail. So, I mean, they've, I've never had the IRB come back to me and say, I'm sending this protocol back because it's too long and you've given me too much information. Like that just doesn't happen, right? So once you've kind of thought through everything for the registered report, then you can actually, then you have something that you can submit to the IRB and with any luck, all of that good thinking that happened in terms of, you know, really sort of getting this feedback and thinking through all of these issues, 
will maybe translate into getting through the IRB more quickly. Again, no promises, depends on your IRB office. Um, so, you, but the point of this slide is really to say, you really need to think through which comes first, the IRB or the registered report. If you've got, you know, um, as an example, it, I'll, I keep going back to my example from our study. In our study, actually, because we were getting de-identified data, so we had no identifying information, we did go through our IRB, and our IRB said, actually, this doesn't qualify as human subjects research. We don't need to see it again. So in that case, actually, we, we did the IRB first, and that was great because we had a lot of leeway. And so we went IRB and then registered reports. So which, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, really depends on your, uh, you know, what you're doing, what your design is, what your IRB is like. But you do want to think through the timing of this and be deliberate. You don't, you don't want to get your registered report accepted and then, or, you know, you don't want to get your, sorry, you don't want to get your IRB accepted, then have to make major changes because because of the registered report process and then have to go back to the IRB again, if you can avoid it. I always have to go back to the IRB multiple times, even without that step, so. All right, so analysis planning. Oh my gosh, it's 157. Analysis planning is uh, harder than you would think um, because you know just because you plan an analysis in advance doesn't mean it's an appropriate analysis. You really need to think through, right, what, what's, you know, what you're doing. This is more problematic for pre-registration, by the way, because, you know, now the onus is on the reviewer. If you've come up with a really bad analysis and three reviewers say it's fine and you get an in-principle acceptance, well, then you're home free, right? That's the advantage of the registered report. Having said that, I mean, you know, we don't necessarily want that to happen, but um, so, so think about that. And, uh, you know, things that you definitely want to think about as you're planning your analyses in advance, I think sometimes people are pretty good about thinking about the big pieces of the design, but they're not necessarily so good at thinking about the little nitty gritty details like, oh, how, you know, they might think about how their variables are measured in terms of like what subscale I'm using or what, you know, what question I'm asking. But a lot of times people don't really think about how they're going to combine different items or different measures, what they're going to do if they have low reliability, how they're going to code certain types of um, items or variables. And, and all of those things, I think, are really important to be as explicit as you can. And, you know, what do you do? You know, other things that can be trickier. What do you try to plan in advance? What are you going to do about attrition? What are you going to do if people, you know, leave, uh, what are you gonna do about careless responding and all those kinds of things. All right, next slide. Um, so practical advice, um, in terms, again, I think that generally speaking, reviewers take a little bit more of a collaborative stance with the registered report because they know that the suggestions that they make can be implemented and so, it feels a little bit more like there's a team, there's a little bit more of a team effort in terms of the registered report, rather than a sort of a, I got you, you should have done this and you didn't do it. Um, so I think that that can be a, a real advantage. Again, you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't the occasional reviewer out there who wants you to do the study that they want you to do instead of the study that you planned or the study that you're thinking of. So, you know, this doesn't actually uh, mean that it doesn't solve problems with reviewer number twos of the world, right? Uh, but in general, I think the reviewers kind of come at this with a little bit more collaborative uh, perspective. Uh, we talked about the fact that conference proposals, I mean, grant proposals and conference papers can be a great, a great uh, way to start. And, you know, if you're not sure if your study makes sense as a registered report, um, it can be a really good idea to ask the editor of the journal that you're considering. So we're at two o'clock. What? I well, I know we're at whatever time of the hour it is now. So can I don't know. Go, yeah, should we go a few more minutes or should we stop? I think you well, can go ahead a few more minutes if you'd like. Okay. To. Well, I'll keep it. I'll I'll be less verbose now. Uh, I will I will run through these slides quickly. So we did a little bit of thinking about you know, different types of studies and maybe 
how they lend themselves to registered reports and what might be some landmines along the way. So I think it's obvious that experimental studies actually really lend themselves well to registered reports. You lay out your experimental design, you know, from design to analysis prior to collecting the data, uh, you do your power analysis, right? You lay that all out. So I won't belabor that. I think experiments really lend themselves nicely to registered reports. So next. Okay, descriptive and survey research. You might be thinking to yourself, well, why would I want to do a registered report if it's just a descriptive study? Um, but I mean, I think you should, right? There's no reason not to. And, and even though it's a descriptive study, you still really have a lot of thinking to do about your measures, your surveys, your instruments, right? What are those going to look like? Um, and also, I think another really important thing if you're thinking about descriptive and survey research is your sampling methodology and your sampling plan, right? So how are you actually getting that sample? Um, and again, you wanna have a detailed data analysis plan. Next. For secondary data analysis, uh, the whole hardest thing is if you already have the data, no peaking, right? So. You are gonna do your registered report and you're gonna get your in principle acceptance before you actually start to do any of your data analysis. But I think secondary data analyses actually are very appropriate for registered reports. And in some sense, the timing issue is, is a little bit easier if the data already exists versus if you're about to go into schools and collect data. Um, if you've used the data for some other study, and this happens a lot with secondary data analysis. I mean, think about the ECLSK and other large, you know, large databases are used for hundreds of studies, right? But if you've used the data for another study, then you're going to want to include an author statement about the data, where it's been used before, and for what purposes in the, in the registered report at stage one. And that will be really important for the reviewers to be able to decide things like, is this actually a different enough study to merit another publication, as well as, um, you know, have they done things that might compromise this actually being a registered report? Next. Okay, longitudinal studies. I mean, obviously, if you're going to do a study that's, you know, several years long, you probably don't, I mean, you know, it could be rough to do a registered report and then wait for eight years to actually publish your results, right? So um, Amanda and I had a long talk about this, actually. You, with any longitudinal study, you're usually going to be publishing, you know, in phases anyway, right? So you could be putting together a registered report for some aspect of the longitudinal study. Um, for example, you know, maybe you've collected baseline data, but you're going to be collecting, you know, some follow-up data at a couple of other time points, right? And you, you know, you're going to write a registered report about this follow-up data. Um, things to think about if you've got longitudinal data, if you're thinking about modeling longitudinal data, you really need to think about the functional form of those data. And anytime you're doing any kind of multi-wave study, you really have to think about attrition. Um, all right, next. Replication studies. Well, of course, replication studies really lend themselves well to registered reports. And one thing that I that we did want to mention is that there are also these things called registered replication reports. So AMPPS, Advances in Methods and Practices in Psychological Science, actually um, publishes registered re replication reports. And this is like a collection of independently conducted direct replications of an original study that share some shared predetermined protocol. So often there are a whole slew of authors on these registered replication reports because there are multiple labs that are running multiple direct replications of the original study. I feel like you see this less in education than you do in psychology because, you know, a lot of times what we're doing are more field-based or quasi-experimental studies that maybe are harder to do direct replications and harder to get many labs, but I actually think that we should think a bit more in education about how we could take this idea and use it in education because, because we do often have these really, we do need to run these large efficacy or effectiveness studies. And the idea of sort of having, you know, 
having multiple labs sort of work, or not labs, we don't usually call them labs, but having multiple groups work on replications, I think is actually smart. Okay, next, qualitative studies. Well, I don't have too much to say about this um, because I don't do a lot of qualitative research myself, honestly, uh, but I think sometimes people think, oh, well, if it's a qualitative study, it can't possibly be pre-registered or it can't possibly be a registered re report. And I don't think that that's true because just like a quantitative study, you can be thinking through your, your design and your methods. So the things you would want to include are things like the theoretical expectations you have, the qualitative tradition you're coming from, what's your sampling plan? How are you going to get your, I mean, sampling plan is different here than it is in a quantitative study, right? But you still have some idea about how you're going to recruit participants for your study. How are you going to collect the data? What do those interview and observation protocols look like? Are there stopping criteria? A lot of times in qualitative study, you're looking for some, you know, right there, you're thinking about when do you have data saturation? So you specify that in advance. And then what kind of coding system are you going to use? What kind of data analysis techniques? So you can totally specify all of those things for qualitative studies. And then the one little bullet point at the top is, it's kind of interesting about less than half of the qualitative research presented at conferences eventually gets published. So file drawer or Google Drive. Next, uh, meta-analysis. So again, I think meta-analyses are natural for registered reports. Um, but things that you wanna make sure that you include in your registered report are the search strategies, right? How are you going to identify the studies for your meta-analysis, which and inclusion and exclusion criteria, which obviously are two of the most important things that you think about in a meta-analysis. And then finally, also, you know, how, what are you going to code for? How are you going to code? And non-registered reports. So there might be studies that don't really lend themselves very well to registered reports. Uh, one example that I, you know, I was thinking about are things like instrument validation. So it's hard enough to get an instrument validation published anyway. You know, there are a lot more instruments that are validated than people that want to publish the eventual articles. But like, if you go through the whole instrument validation process and your instrument is not good, like it doesn't, right? You don't have factors. The reliability is poor. You don't. You know, you had an idea about what you wanted to measure, but the whole thing kind of falls apart in the validation process, which happens all the time, especially the first time around when you're creating an instrument. Nobody needs to read that, right? And so uh, if you think about like a registered report, yeah, you could specify all the things you're going to do and maybe all those steps are right. But if at the end of the day, the instrument is crap, like that's not really a publishable piece. So that's, I think, a classic example of the kind of research that we might do that doesn't really lend itself to a registered report. Doesn't mean you couldn't pre-register the study though. So remember that. Other things are things like pilot studies. Maybe you're doing small scale development work, right? Maybe that doesn't need to, you know, that's not gonna be a registered report either. All right, done with that slide. Oops. Um, so I think we've talked a lot about these, you know, how, how long will it take and will it take longer? I don't think it has to take longer overall really. Um, but you're, you're spreading the timing out in a very different way than you are with regular sort of a standard research project. You talked about qualitative research. Are you more likely to get scooped? I don't think so. And remember that you, you know, you've got the ink on paper already. In some sense, I feel like you're, even with pre-registration and with registered reports, even more so, I feel like you're less likely to get scooped because you've already got down on paper what you're planning to do. Whereas in the olden days, maybe you go to a conference, you have a couple of drinks, you talk to somebody, you tell them your idea, you don't have it pre-registered, you don't have a registered report, and next thing you know, somebody has stolen your idea and they're running with it. So I really think that both registered reports and pre-registrations are good insurance against getting scooped rather than the opposite. Um, and how do you get your research team on board? I don't know. Have them watch this. Have them watch this awesome webinar, and then they'll they'll totally be enthralled. Um, and then can you put multiple studies in one paper? You know, this is something I always struggle with in general, like what's the right brain size for a paper? Often we have these larger studies that are so large, you can't actually fit everything in one paper. But I think when you think about registered reports, think about 
the grain size of the registered report as being the same as the grain size for the eventual publication. So you could actually have multiple registered reports coming out of one large research project. All right. Um, we've talked about this a bit. Um, you know, you want to make sure that everything that you've got at stage one is as detailed as possible. It's really important that what you're, you know, I, I, I like to think of this as like, if you, if you were to just sort of disappear, somebody else could pick up, pick up the registered report and they could do the study the way that you intended it. The other thing that I think makes a registered report different from a pre-registration is that you really need to pay more importance to the significance of the study, the theoretical framework and the lit review. You could do a pre-registration without giving a lot of, um, a, you know, a lot of attention to sort of the front end of the manuscript. But again, this is going out for review. And as Amanda said, one of the things you need to do is convince the reviewers that this is a study that's important and worth doing. And the only way to do that is to really be, you know, to really talk about the theoretical, the significance of the study, the framework, and the lit review. So don't give short shrift to that. I think you, we really spend as much time on the front end of the paper as we normally would for a publication. The nice thing is, though, now it's written, right? I'm sure we'll probably revise a little bit. Um, our stage one report ended up being as long as our eventual publication, by the way, because there's so much to say. All right, next. Um, so if there are any deviations, if something happens and you can't do what you planned, you need to let the editor know as soon as possible. Some very minor deviations might be fine, but you know, there, in, a, in the worst case scenario, if there's a really large deviation that might invalidate the stage one acceptance. So I'll, I'll give an example. Maybe you say you're going to recruit you know, 200 people and randomly assign them to treatment and control and you give the power analysis and all that stuff and you were only able to get 20 people for your study. Well, okay, it may have been a phase one acceptance, but that was predicated on the idea that you had 100 treatment and 100 control, not 10 treatment and 10 control, right? So, um, you know, if you, you, you have to do what you say you're going to do. And again, if you end up with 198 people, is the editor going to care? Probably not. But if you end up with 20, I think that's going to be a huge problem. Next. Um, you know, a lot of people have said, it comes up in those AERA open reflections, and it, uh, it, it comes up, it came up actually in the, the editor's comments about that AERA open special issue that people feel a lot freer writing the discussion section once they have the phase one acceptance because they feel like they don't have to worry about whether the paper is going to be rejected or not. So, um, you know, there's, this is a quote, we felt the discussion became more honest and vivid as we could, for example, give sharper opinions. So, um, so that's, so that's kind of nice. The other thing to keep in mind is if the phase one or the paper ends up being as long as a regular article, sometimes what you have to do is sort of trim out some of the detail that you had in that in your first paper and some of those things might go into the online supplement. So they still need to be available to everybody, but sometimes there might be a level of detail that you have there that for space reasons ends up going online. And then this question, will the manuscript be peer reviewed again or will it go through editorial review only? You should assume that it will be peer reviewed again. There is the possibility that, you know, if things are really straightforward, the editor could choose to make an editorial decision, but you should just assume it's, it's gonna be peer reviewed twice. But the second time around usually goes faster. And we have lots of resources that you would be better off looking at the actual slides for rather than trying to copy down now, especially given that we're way over time. And I guess we don't have time for questions, but I guess that's okay because we can't see anybody anyway. So um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I think if we don't get kicked out of this room, I'm happy to like stick around oh. and answer questions if, if people have them. I don't know, Leslie, tell us if we will get kicked out. Uh, no, that's fine. I don't think you'll get kicked out. And also, um, if you do, if there's anybody in the audience who would like to ask a direct question, if you raise your hand, I can, um, I can uh, let you speak. <laughs> there's a question in the Q and A, um, Jonathan. If you're still here, I'm. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, so I would love 
to hear you articulate it, maybe. Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, Amanda and uh, Betsy. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, sorry, I guess I didn't give a whole lot of context regarding uh, what I was talking about. Uh, but with that, I kind of mentioned my question. Uh, the basis of it is still thinking about the publish for parish paradigm when, you know, uh, a lot of the, the university hiring and funding agencies base um, heavily use age index and impact factor and such, you know, and obviously it's a whole kind of connected system where, you know, quote unquote, significant results are a really huge part of that entire conversation. I guess I just like, because it's not uh, science is you know naturally fairly decentralized and you know you have the authors you have uh, and then you know this huge support network to kind of like have the findings of the scientific community be communicated as well and funded etc cetera, etc cetera. and i guess the idea is right now for trying to fight this publish or perish paradigm which is largely you know um you know the poor incentives uh from you know, just the inclusion criteria and the marketing kind of capabilities of the journals. Um, how do we kind of like also get the uh, you know universities and the funding agencies more on our side and communicate to them so that they're actually on their checklist, kind of pushing for uh, this type of inclusion? Because like you know, we have age index and impact factors. Just wondering whether or not you can summarize the activity of you know, how people are using pre-registration um, such that you can kind of get uh, uh, on board this process a little bit quicker. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I think of registered reports as such a stronger solution than re pre-registration is because it still allows you to publish without perishing. Um, that like, this idea that like, oh, if I pre-register all of my studies, you still might not get published, but registered reports, that's not the case. And so I find it to be a really optimal solution, especially for early career researchers who maybe don't have the, um, you know, the pull to like change their system. Uh -huh. um, even, even given that though, I have found myself like in my, um, you know, reports that I submit, I'm an assistant professor, I'm still like untenured. Um, I have like a footnote that I put in my um, in my statements that says like what a registered report is and what this like in principle acceptance is and why I've put it in this specific section on my um, bibliography. But I think um, you know one one of the things that that our group is hoping to do is actually do some trainings with like the tenure and promotion committees at universities to teach them like what registered reports are mm -hmm. and why they should maybe get like a little bonus kind yeah. of view. Um, yeah. You know, the, it's it's a more, it's a more rigorous process. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason why I like registered reports is that you still publish. <laughs> yeah. um, but but I do agree. I think that it needs to be a lot more done at the system level to be recognizing all of the work that that people are doing to improve transparency and openness. Yeah, thanks for addressing that. I was uh, actually mentioning earlier in a previous like I I forgot talk about like how uh, you know we could talk to tenure committees because like it's easy. It seems a lot easier to onboard uh, the younger you know like graduate students and such because like but uh, it's the more experienced. Uh, researchers that uh, seem to be a little bit more hesitant just because it's already so difficult <laughs> yeah. and on top of it you know registered reports and such and uh, open access and all that such like it doesn't necessarily help their odds to 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 make the cut in fact if they start to focus on you know the um publishing in these 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 novel uh platforms that might even hurt their chances because they're yeah because the yeah criteria is so um, the competition is so stiff and it's yeah they need to work on those numbers. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I think is really interesting. We do a lot of trainings on registered reports, and especially for those in the medical field, there is this um, question that's like, well, if I do a registered report and I find something like amazing, can I withdraw the paper and submit to Nature or like the Lancet or what? I don't know. Good, really good medical journals. And I find it so funny because I, I actually think about registered reports as like the opposite way. Like if I am ever going to get a nature publication, it's going to be it's a registered report. Um, and it's like 
I think actually way easier to get into some of these big, fancy, high impact journals through the registered reports mechanism because they are adopting them. Um, okay. All of the natures do it now. And so like, if you're ever gonna get in at nature, you might as well do it through a registered report. Um, because otherwise, you know, you can submit, but you'll never get in. <laughs> um, or maybe you will, I don't know. But like, that's kind of my mentality is I think some people are worried they're gonna get in worse journals doing this, but I actually think you'll get into better journals personally. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the yeah, other question. If there's no other questions, I also have another question, but like, you know, give someone else a chance. <laughs> An idiot, I'm muted. Okay. so. Um, I wanted to say something about your last question before you say ask another question, which is, you know, I mean, every tenure committee is different, of course, yeah. right? Um, but I've been, I've been on, I've been around a long time. I've been on PTR committees at the school level and at the department level, um, and you know, I've mentored people through the process. And here's what I'll say: um, I think that junior faculty often get really, really, really focused on numbers. Like they think that there's some, you know, like magic number, I need 12, right? I need 12 pubs by tenure. But the reality is that what the PTR committee is looking for is evidence that you are going to continue to be a successful scholar, that if I give you a job for life, that you are not like going to disappear into the ether, but that you are going to be successful and that you are going to have a good career. And so, I mean, from that perspective, somebody who's got a whole bunch of registered reports with phase one acceptances, right? You know, yeah. that's a good bet, right? Somebody who, because, because that's a guarantee that that is coming out. And so I think that, um, you know, again, there's no guarantees about what's going to work and not work for given tenure committees, but, but I think that it provides this evidence that you're on the right trajectory. And that's ultimately actually what the committee's looking for. Yeah, thanks. That was, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's very good to know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I have to admit that uh, upon hearing what you had to say, I totally forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> so yeah, maybe you'll come back to me, but if not, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just move on. Thanks. Thanks for answering my questions. Sure. There are a couple of questions and comments in the chat about kind of the, the timeline. And, and one of the things that I've experienced is that it feels really different to do a registered report because there's kind of like, I'm used to a framework where it's like, hurry up and then collect the data. And it's all kind of like this one thing. And all of the waiting happens like after you've written the paper and you can kind of mentally move on from the project. And so it feels like, the registered report takes longer because that waiting period is moved to the middle of the project. Um, and that's something that I've had to kind of like restructure my lab around like building in more redundancy with undergrad training because somebody who is around during the stage one preparation might not be around when we actually collect the data. Um, and so it's it's I think it's worthwhile to like give it a try the first time, let yourself sit with the un uncomfortability, but then like at the end, it actually like, it's so great to just like collect the data, write it up, and then it's like published so fast, um, you know, so much faster than like shopping it around at all of these different journals. And um, our lab is actually trying to collect a little bit more information about timeline um because one of the things that's kind of difficult is we do have information about like when it's submitted to the final journal what was the timeline but we don't have a lot of information about you know our registered reports submitted to a lot of different journals before they find a home or is it that you know you kind of submit to one journal and it makes it in there um so our lab is trying to collect data on that actually now um as a registered report about registered reports um but it is it is still kind of open information and we're relying a lot on um kind of just uh people's stories i think i don't see any other questions me neither all right. Well, given that we went quite a bit over, I guess we'll wrap it up here. 
Thanks, everybody. Thank you both. That was just brilliant. I loved all your little cartoons. That it made it very entertaining as well as informative. So, so thanks for <laughs> both. Relevant cartoons. That's that's what we aim for. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.